you hadn't um, drowned all music but its own I'll wake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends his wandering eye, all mysteries so bright. Had to quit it too, because I'm not going to have any voice left for preaching if I don't. You just can't sing those songs at half volume. <clears throat> Better to go down swinging, as they used to tell us in Little League. All right, Revelation. Turn to uh, chapter 13. And we're going to work our way to the first half of chapter 14 if the Lord allows. I want to very quickly, we should be on number 11, Jason. Did it get uploaded? <laughs> okay, I'm good at that, <clears throat> I think. Um, let me give you the, the very quick review uh, on Revelation, because again, it is a, uh, as we opened the book and, and John saw the first vision, and then he's called up into heaven, we see that the uh, Lamb receives a scroll, and that scroll is sealed uh, seven times. And he begins to open those different seals, and as each one opens, we see more and more of the visions that John sees. And uh, from this, we understand that the seven seals contain the seven uh, uh, bowls and they contain the seven trumpets. It's just one long continuous uh, scroll, kind of like the uh, old printout papers you used to have when the computers first came out. It just kept joining, joining, joining together. And so as we looked at that, uh, we saw, first of all, the vision of Christ. We saw the seven seals. We saw the trumpets and we saw the bowls. And then we're in this section right now that started way back in chapter 10 and runs all the way through chapter 14, which is an interlude. It's a place in which the Lord, um, in His uh, omnipotence and His omniscience, knew that we needed a break. We needed to see that there's something greater going on than just the events on earth. He also knows that one day during the time of the uh, tribulation itself, there will be people who need to understand that uh, because of what John saw, they have hope. They have uh, something more than just uh, the endurance and trying to survive with nothing to look forward to. And so this interlude is going to play a very important part for them. Uh, whether they have copies of the Bible, and I'm sure they will hold those as precious, whether they have them in their memory, the people who believe in God during the tribulation, and there will be millions, if not billions, of people during that time. Uh, those people need to know what's happening in heaven in this interlude while they're going through the difficulties on earth. Oh, hallelujah. That worked out. I just kept on talking there. <laughs> Should have waved at me there, Brother Jason. <laughs> I used up all that extra time I saved by singing two verses this morning. Um, and what we're looking at today is the counterfeiters or the counterfeits. Uh, and let me, get, let me begin this by telling you something that my uh, uh, granddad used to tell me when I was a little boy and I'd go I don't know, to the store, and uh, he'd give me some money, and, and I, there's some change expected back. And I guess, since he was from Texas, you probably heard this too, he said, don't, ex don't accept any wooden nickels. Now, I've never seen a wooden nickel in my entire life. 
I, I would think you would know a wooden nickel was a wooden nickel. But the idea was that you could be cheated, that you could get something that you were not supposed to. That somebody would try to give you a wooden nickel instead of a nickel nickel. And that's what a counterfeit is. It's something that cheats. It's something that robs. Uh, back during World War II, um, the Nazis came up with a plan to try and weaken, uh, especially the, na the nation of Britain, by counterfeiting. And what they did was they went into the um, concentration camps and they got all the printers, the lithographers, the artists, uh, all these people who had abilities in this form of uh, work, and then they gave them a five pound England banknote and they told them, copy this. Uh, if you do it, you live. If you don't do it, we'll kill you. And so they began copying this and they made a perfect, a near perfect copy of an English five pound note back in the 1940s. Uh, in all, they printed something like, in today's money, about $10 billion in English pounds of that five pound note, which was the most used during that time period. Now, the Nazis originally intended to just fly over England and parachute out all this money onto the English countryside and bankrupt the economy of Great Britain. But before this happened, some spies that were in Germany found out about it. They sent word to Churchill, they sent word to the U.S. Treasury, and they said this is happening. And uh, the Germans found out that their plan had been spoiled, and so they decided, well, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do instead is we're going to take all that money, $10 billion worth, and we're going to buy weapons, uh, we're going to pay for spies, we're going to use it for bribery. And so they used money that wasn't theirs to pay off people and, and buy things uh, on somebody else, again, counterfeiting. So today, from Revelation chapter 13, we're going to read about the Christ counterfeit. Now, he's called the beast. He's called the Antichrist. He is a pseudo-savior, a masquerading, masquerading Messiah. He is a lying Lord. He pretends to be the Savior of the world, sent by God to bring peace and an everlasting kingdom. That's how he wins the confidence of the Jewish people. He's even able to stop the enemies of Israel with a peace treaty. And he may even be responsible for rebuilding the temple for them. So for all intents and purposes, he looks like their answer to thousands and thousands of years of prayer. But in actuality, he is the worst kind of evil. He is an evil that pretends to be good. So here in Revelation chapter 13, John is writing, kind of like those spies in England sent word to Churchill and to the U.S. Treasury. He is a spy writing to the future nation of Israel and to those who believe in Jesus Christ about the counterfeits they will encounter in the last world war, the war of Satan against the Lamb of God. Um, Satan, when he tried to lead the revolt in heaven that we looked a little bit at uh, last week in Revelation 12, when he saw that he was not going to win that initial war, he settled on a war of attrition. A little bit by little bit, person by person, nation by nation, philosophy by philosophy, attack on the things of God. He wants to corrupt and destroy God's highest creation especially, and that is man who is made in the image of God. He despises mankind because it is a constant reminder of God and God's hope and God's aim and God's purpose for why he created man in the first place. So in order to execute this long game, Satan over centuries and centuries has been trying to keep the truth from mankind. The truth about redemption, the truth about uh, hope, the truth about grace. And so in order to do that, he has tried to create counterfeit truths, lies that sounded like truth, looked like truth, but at their core, there is no redemption, there is no grace, and there is no hope. He's been extremely successful in this. He's had thousands of years to perfect it. These counterfeits of Satan at their core are the deadliest, most damnable lies. It's like a bottle of Tylenol that turns out to be strychnine or a candy apple filled with razor blades. Satan's counterfeits are planted in order to trap and kill spiritual man. So he's utilized this game plan of counterfeiting and corrupting things of God in order to disrupt and destroy the creation of God. And we see it here in Revelation chapter 13 as his greatest, his finest, but also his last diabolical counterfeits. So look with me to the first counterfeit, Revelation chapter 13, and the first 10 verses, the beast from the sea. 
And I stood upon the sea, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose name, names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. If any man hear... If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So this is the counterfeit Christ. We now fully meet the beast. Now this word beast here is not the same as the word for the beast that we find in Revelation chapters um, 6 all the way through the throne room scenes in heaven. That word was the word zoa, and that's where we get our word zoo and uh, zoological. It's the Greek word for life. It's the Greek word for a creature. Uh, this word, though, truly fits the English idea of a beast. This is a wild beast. This is a, uh, the word here is therion, and it means a wild beast, a poisonous beast. It is a monster, and that's exactly the description we're going to have of this beast. This is the Antichrist, Satan's counterfeit of the Son of God and the Messiah of the Jewish people. The Bible says he rises up out of the sea. The sea here is used in this symbolic passage. As it is the sea of mankind. Everything in chapter 13 is symbolic. There's nothing literal here other than the, the uh, attack of Satan and the power. Everything else is symbolic so that those people then will be able to understand what's happening and so that we can get a glimpse and find comfort and hope whatever we go through. So the sea is mankind. It is humankind. We know this because in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, it says this, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the sea is mankind, especially the nations of the Gentiles. So that means that this is the therion, the beast, is a human being. He's not a demon. He's not supernatural. He is simply a man who has been empowered and willfully possessed by Satan, by the dragon. Some other things about his description. The Bible says he has seven heads. This is the same as the dragon who gives him his power. Uh, the dragon has seven heads. The Therion, the wild beast, has seven heads. The seven heads stand for the seven Gentile empires, the powers that have ruled the world. Now, in preaching this, we can't really go into the detail we, we'd like to go into if we were teaching it. You'll have to come back. We do that on Sunday nights or Sunday afternoons. We do that on Wednesdays. So I'm just going to give you a very quick look at these because the symbols have to be understood uh, for, by us and for them as well in the future. So these empires, these Gentile world powers, some count these empires from Egypt all the way to the revived Roman Empire of Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter 2. And that fits number-wise, seven kingdoms, and uh, here we have seven heads. But I think that actually it shouldn't start with Egypt, but it should start with Babylon, just as Daniel's vision started. That creates problems, and again, we're not going to take a lot of time to fill it out or figure it out, but we're going to show you what I think it means. So here's how these kingdoms would break down under that first view. The first kingdom is Egypt, the second one is Assyria, then Babylon, Greece, the Roman revived empire, which is what takes place during the tribulation, and then finally the Antichrist kingdom on his own. So we have seven. But I think this is a better count. You start with Babylon, just because all of the visions of Daniel started with Babylon. It just makes sense. So you have Babylon, Greece, Rome, the revived Roman Empire, and then the Antichrist during the first half of the tribulation. That gives us five. And this is before he receives his deadly wound that we're going to read about in just a little bit. Then number six is the woman on the scarlet beast. After the beast dies, she rules. 
this spiritual world power, this false religion, this other counterfeit of everything uh, that is, is Christianity and everything that is every religion in the world, she takes power. And then she is killed by the ten kings. They kill the woman and they reign during the beast's absence. When he comes back forth from the pit, as the Bible says, then number eight is the returned Antichrist, the last three and a half years. Now, where do you get that extra number eight? Well, it's from Revelation chapter 17 and verse 10. Listen to what it says. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. That's the Antichrist. The other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That's when he comes back. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. So this is right, being written at the time that he is in the pit. He's not here yet. And goeth down into perdition. Look at number 12, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And so the beast is the eighth, and he, the kings who have power for one very short time give their power to him when he comes back from the pit after they have killed the uh, scarlet woman that sits on the beast. We also see in the description that the, the uh, Antichrist has ten horns with ten crowns, and they all are titled blasphemy. This is the revived Roman Empire that will play uh, just as the tribulation begins. They are part of Satan's kingdom, and they are first foretold in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 42. All of the Bible is a unit. All of it stands from Genesis to Revelation. <coughs> and if you can't find proof for whatever it is that you're asserting in other places of the Bible, then you shouldn't make any kind of assertions. But here we have a very clear picture of what's taking place with the Antichrist, the beast, the Therion. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So I put an image up here. I know it's not going to be something you can see all that well. But if you stood this up, this is what Nebuchadnezzar saw. He couldn't uh, figure it out. He went and Daniel figured it out. And he said, uh, O Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold. And then it goes down through all the kingdoms that will have power over Jerusalem during this time of the Gentiles. And then it finally comes down to these feet, part of clay and part of iron. The idea is that they're pottery, they're ceramic, very hard, very strong, but brittle. And so that's the revived Roman Empire, and its ten toes are those ten kings that we just read about in Revelation. It's amazing, it's a little complex, it can get very complicated. Uh, you might leave here <laughs> wondering what all we talked about this morning, but it is an amazing way in which God puts these things together. And all the way back during the time of Daniel, when uh, these things were going on for those people in that dark time, he sent them this vision. And now he's backing this up. Now he's giving more detail, this idea of progressive revelation. And so those ten kings are the same as the ten toes, and those will, of course, uh, give their power to the Antichrist and kill the woman when she rises to power after he dies. Now, Daniel chapter 7 also talks about this revived Roman Empire. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. Here are the, we see the, ten king, the kingdom and the Antichrist is called the little horn. Now, I'm only giving you this because it just ties everything in so well. It lets you understand who this person is. And so Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were for it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by their roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things, blasphemous things. And so that is the Antichrist. He is the little horn. This beast with the, uh, uh, the iron teeth and the, the visage of a leopard and a bear and these ten horns, that is the revived Roman Empire. And he comes to power, and there's ten kings that make this federation. And he somehow either kills three, or he takes over their countries, or they give them their countries. But anyway, they're pulled up by the roots, 
and he rises to power and ultimately takes control of the entire revived Roman Empire. So, we have been, this probably takes place in the book of Revelation all the way back when we were looking at Revelation chapter 6, when the rider on the white horse is first seen. The first scroll, the scroll is open, the seal is open, and there's a rider on the white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went another horse that was red. Power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So that's when the Antichrist takes power. He leads this war. And then he brings about peace, and it may even be an excuse that they were attacking Israel. He gives them peace, and that establishes them at him as their false messiah. So finally, John's description of the counterfeit Christ tells us that he had the characteristics of a leopard, a bear, and a lion with the power of a dragon. These are all descriptions from Daniel chapter 7 that we just read of the empires of the world. So the Antichrist will incorporate all the worst of these pagan powers into his kingdom. And very important. John says, one of the ten heads is wounded as if unto death. The deadly wound is then healed, and then the Antichrist, the beast, continues for 42 months, three and a half years. That's the last half of the tribulation. During that time, he's given power to prevail against God's people. He is worshipped by all kindreds, tongues, and nations whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Something happens to the beast. It may be an assassination. It may be a political coup. It may be a war loss. Perhaps he dies. It seems that would be the obvious way of interpreting that. But whatever happens, he comes back from that. The Bible says he rises from the pit, and when he comes back, no one can stand against him. Now all the world believes that the counterfeit Christ has come back from the dead. He truly must be the great hope for mankind. Satan's greatest counterfeit is now in full power, but it's going to be a very, very short reign. And the last thing I want you to notice is the delusion that comes. Paul may have been thinking of this very event when the Antichrist comes back supposedly from the pit, supposedly is resurrected again as Christ was truly resurrected. And he wrote this in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And so it's going to be so powerful, such a perfect counterfeit, that the whole world is going to look at that and say, this is truly our great Messiah, our great Savior. The world without faith in Jesus will be utterly deceived. They will be, there will be true believers in that deadly counterfeit of, of Satan. So, all that detail. Let me try to bring you back now. I believe that even in this day and age, we are primed for the Antichrist. Now, I don't mean that I think he's waiting outside the door. I don't think he's going to come in the next week or day. I think all this could happen very quickly. But we are being primed for that. We told you that Satan has been playing the long game, this war of attrition, attacking the creation of God bit by bit, people by people, nation by nation. And as part of that, he's used counterfeits throughout history. See, Satan doesn't know when the Lord is coming back. And so he has to have a potential antichrist, a potential beast, to step into that role of world leader available at all times. That's frightening. Many people believe that when Hitler came on the scene, he was the antichrist. And he fit the pattern. I mean, he came from the old revived Roman Empire. He had been thrown in prison. He had no power. He came back from nothing. He spoke great things. His oratory ability was supposed to be so great that people just couldn't resist him. And he made war against the people of God. I think Satan pulled the trigger too early. I think Satan thought, this is the man. This is the time. And the whole world went to war, just like it says in the Bible. And yet it wasn't the time. And Satan got the wrong guy. But what that means is that right now there is somebody waiting in the wings that Satan has got ready to go. And he has to have this world through the counterfeits primed to follow that person at a moment's notice. And they, you look at that and say, how could those people, those religious people, how could they possibly let, him, let Hitler do what he did? Well, they had been primed. And we in this world are even more primed to believe those kind of things. 
1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says this, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. So John says it's already out there. That, that spirit of Antichrist is there. This world is primed for the big lie of the counterfeit Christ. Much of what we're seeing today is exactly that. Let me give you some examples real quick. This world believes in evolution, not creation. Christians who say they believe the Bible believe in evolution and not creation. What that means is that man exists by random chance, not by the direct creative act of God. God is removed from the universe if we believe in evolution. In 1933, the Humanist Manifesto was written, and it declared that man didn't need a make-believe God, didn't need miracles, didn't need a savior, didn't need a heaven. It said things like humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Humanism believes that man is part of nature. He's emerged as a result of a continuous process. Humanists find that the traditional dualism of mind and body, we would say spirit and body, has passed. It's rejected. They said that they were convinced that time has passed for theism, deism, modernism, and several thoughts of new and several varieties of new thought. Today, most people in our world are humanist. If you told them that, they would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I'm, I'm an American. <laughs> or they'd tell you something else. But for our philosophies, our beliefs, our world is a humanistic world. It does not accept God as being in this world or the creator of this world or has anything to do with this world. Man, as the humanists say, is the measure of all things. Because of that, they have rejected almost all moral and ethic teachings and law of God's word. Therefore, in today's world, because it is a humanistic world, the abortion of an innocent baby in the womb is not murder, while the actual murder of an individual is not punished by taking the life of the murderer. It devalues the life that was taken by the murderer and says, it's not worth anything. We're going to put this guy in prison for life, pay for his meals, take care of him, and just let him live out his life. And the person he killed, well, they weren't worth anything. If they were worth something, then God's word would be true. He that takes a life by, his, by man, how his life be taken. The most innocent among us are given death, while the most guilty are given life. Our society believes that homosexuality is not sin, that you can reject the way God created you and choose your own gender. The American Medical Association recently called for gender to be removed from birth certificates, saying it has no basis in science. States like California and New York have already taken gender off birth certificates. In our own nation, we see that riots are called peaceful demonstrations, while peaceful demonstrations are called attempted coups. In our society, anarchy is order, chaos is freedom, and the most sickening sin is holy. In our world today, churches are evil, Christians are haters, and God himself is the real monster. You can go to city halls in different cities, and there will be a statue of Satan called Bahamut, and they will say, that's our God, and he is a good God has two little children worshiping at his feet. And that's in, <laughs> it's in Oklahoma City, and they couldn't do anything to stop it. We are primed for the Antichrist. All it will take is the right event and the right man, and Satan already has the man ready to go. Let's look at the next beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. We have the beast from the sea. Now we have the beast from the earth. And I beheld another beast coming up, out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the power of these miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man should buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six, 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 six. This is the counterfeit forerunner. The second beast is also called the false prophet. He will be the anti-forerunner, the, anti the false John the Baptist to the false Christ of the tribulation. 
The Bible says he rises from the earth. He has two horns like a lamb. He has the voice of a dragon. He performs miracles like the two witnesses did in the first three and a half years. And as the forerunner to the beast, he will cause people to worship the beast. He will even create an image of the beast that comes to life and causes people to worship this image or they will be killed. This image is referred to by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. And he warns them this is the ultimate sign of what's going to happen during the time of the midpoint of the tribulation. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. For then shall be great tribulation." such as that was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall, ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. The world under Satan's counterfeits would destroy itself except God. So the false prophet will put that image in the temple, and this will be clearly understood as a sign to the Jewish people, this is not our Messiah. Our Messiah would never erect an image. This is the cardinal rule. This is the first commandment would never erect an image and put it in the temple and then tell us to worship that image. God is an invisible God. God says there should be no graven image of him. And so when that happens, that's the breaking of the covenant. And these Jewish people know that's not our Messiah. And Jesus tells them, run. Run for your life. Because this is it. you got three and a half years to try and physically survive on the earth. The false prophet will put that image... That'll be the clearly understood sign to the Jewish people. They run and they must hide. Another significant thing is this mark of the beast. All these are going to be ways in which those people can recognize and, and not be fooled in the first place. The other significant thing, this mark of the beast, John tells them that the false prophet does this in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. However this mark will be put on or in people, it will be necessary if they are to buy or sell anything. It could be as simple as a tattoo. It could be an RFID tag, the little rice, looks like a, a chip of rice or a grain of rice, and they simply take a an injection and put it in your web of your hand right here. It could be an ultraviolet tattoo, a scan code that only shows up under black light, so you won't have to be seen with this unsightly number or something else on your head. It doesn't matter how it's done, only that it will force the world to do what the beast and the cross prophet tell them to do. Now, <laughs> this used to sound far-fetched. How could anyone in their right mind believe that such a thing would be okay? That you would let somebody do something like that to you? It sounded far-fetched just about a year ago. Well, all you have to do is take a look at the news and see how many people in this nation are calling for a vaccine mandate and a vaccine passport. And once again, realize how primed we are for the Antichrist. Politicians, news pundits, and people on social media are calling for everyone to comply or not to be allowed to shop, to go to school, or even to come out of their houses. Now, please understand, I'm not making a statement about the vaccines being bad or that you shouldn't get one. I'm not doing that at all. I'm certainly not saying that they are the mark of the beast. If I did that, our uh, Facebook video might go viral. <laughs> I, might, I might make the big times if I made a statement like that. That's not what I'm saying at all. That would be ridiculous. Um, probably I wouldn't even be the first one to have said it. If you look on YouTube, there's probably already people who've said such a thing. Remember what we said about Satan. He's always had a man to step in and be the Antichrist and only needing the right event to put him in place. I don't believe this is the event. I don't. But it will be an event or a crisis like this. And we are being primed to accept it then. Now, if you're a child of God, you will be here. You'll be out of this world. You'll be standing in heaven and, and praying. But for those who are left here, and some of these loudest voices are some of the ones who hate God most right now. They're the ones saying, do this or else. You have no right to go out in public unless you do what I tell you to do. 
and it'll be worse then. Get the mark of the beast, or you will not be able to leave your home. Your children will not go to school. You will not be able to buy or sell anything. Your only hope is to try and trade for some food with somebody who takes pity on you. Chances are your next door neighbor is going to hate you because you didn't get a vaccine or didn't get a mark of the beast. When it happens, we as a society have already been primed for deception. The majority will say, sign me up, put that beautiful mark right here. And they'll do it with joy and gladness in their heart because that's their God. That's who they worship. So the final note about the false prophet is this number, 666, more famous than even the book of Revelation to the world at large because people who've never read the book of Revelation know about 666. It's in movies. It's in horror stories. It's, in, it's all over the place, science fiction. This is John's final warning about the mark of the beast. He says, here is wisdom. Uh, this is the number of man, 600, three score and six. He says very plainly, the mark is the number of man. That's because man was made on the sixth day. So six is the number of man. The mark of the beast will, six, will be six, six, six. So now everything in this passage today has been symbolic, and so I don't think the mark will actually be 666. I don't think you'll see people walking around with big 666 on their foreheads. But whatever the mark is, it will be an affirmation of man as elevated to the place of godhood. When they worship the beast or the image of the beast, they are worshiping themselves. So why would they mind a reminder of that ascending truth on their forehead or in their right hand? As humanism's creed, creed shouts, Man is the measure of all things. So you think they won't want that? For them it's going to be, look, we have become gods. And our God that, who led us to this place wants us to put a mark on our head to celebrate that? Absolutely, no problem. This is the last move in Satan's game strategy. He will use the beast and the false prophet to imitate the Messiah and the forerunner. He will try and replace the true trinity with this counterfeit terror triad. This is why the number six is repeated three times. Six, six, six. The number of man is a symbol of the unholy trinity. I don't think it's going to look like that. I just think it says this is the unholy trinity, the devil's trinity. It will bring Satan what he has always desired. We looked at this verse last week in Isaiah 14. This is the ultimate goal, and Satan thinks he's going to achieve it in the last week of time of Daniel's vision, Revelation uh, time of the tribulation. Revelation 14, I, Satan says, will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's what Satan's working towards. Centuries now, he's been working to just one thing. He wants to be God. And he's going to drag all of God's creation into the pits of hell with him to do that. This is the ultimate goal of humanism. So how can these people during this time hope to beat Satan and, and these masterpieces of counterfeiting? How in our own time can we hope to stop the humanism, the anarchy, the immorality, the delusions that make people believe a lie? So if we went back to that idea of the counterfeit money, you remember, uh, you probably heard the story, but when they're training treasury agents whose job it is to tra track down counterfeiters, when they're training them to spot counterfeit money, they don't give them thousands and thousands and thousands of counterfeit bills and tell them know all the mistakes. They don't show them all these different flawed counterfeits. That would be impossible. They are taught instead by just giving them a genuine bill. And they say, know this bill. They are told to see the real money, the genuine article, they are taught about every colored thread, every watermark, every invisible writing, how the ink and the paper and the engraving points to the real thing. They have to know the real thing so well that they can spot the counterfeit. And that is what happens next in the epistle of Jesus. Revelation chapter 14. I'm only going to touch on it this morning. Look at Revelation chapter 14, the first few verses. It's not the beast from the sea. It's not the beast from the earth. Oh, no. <laughs> now we see the best from Mount Zion. Chapter 14, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. 
And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which have not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They, these are they which allow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, follow the Lamb. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. They see the real thing. They know the real thing. And when they see the true Lamb of God, when they see the true Christ, they will not be fooled. And they will be able to stand firm. When it seems Satan is won, when it seems the people of God have lost and are reduced to hiding and fearing, even to go out into the world. When it's the darkest day that the world has ever known, Jesus stands up. Jesus stands up. He stands up for his people. Jesus stands up for Israel. Jesus stands up to rise to battle against the unholy people, unholy trinity. Jesus stands up. It's just short three words, but it contains all the power of the universe and all the plan of God poured into that exact moment. Jesus stands up. The Lamb of God stands on Mount Zion. He's not seen in the temple now, but outside on the Mount of God and with him. The 144,000 that have died in his service during the first half of the tribulation. Their forehead bears the mark of the God their father and they stand in honor with Jesus for the great sacrifice they've given. They stand in anticipation of what is as if to say, we are coming and heaven is coming with us. And heaven recognizes the significance of, the significance of this moment for another the great songs of Zion breaks forth. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters. It's like the idea of crashing waterfalls as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. What a moment. What glory to be there and hear that song played on heavenly harps that accompany the song of the 144,000, the heroes of God. So let me bring this to a conclusion. Right now, we are in a very dark world. This world isn't as dark as it will be during that time, the time of the tribulation, but it is dark. The Antichrist has not seized power, but as John said, today there are many little Antichrist. It may seem impossible to see our way to victory, to turn our family, friends, and communities to the truth. It may seem a lost cause to pray for a nation that has believed such great delusions and now believes the lies of Satan almost without exception. It may seem that way, but the solution is the same as we see in Revelation chapter 14. When it's the darkest, look to heaven. Look to Mount Zion. Look up and see Jesus is standing for his people. Put your eyes on him. Put your faith in him. Put your hope in him. And place all those things on his strong shoulders. He is standing for us. And the darkness of this world cannot stop him. Do you need to see past the darkness, the lies, the deception, and the counterfeits of the dragon? Then look to the great shining truth, the great unchanging reality of the Son of God. Put your eyes on the one who is, cannot truly be counterfeited. Put your eyes upon Jesus Christ, the genuine article. Put your eyes on him, and Satan cannot fool you. Let me close with this passage from Hebrews. I'll not read the whole chapter. But Paul was talking to the suffering Hebrews during that time. These Hebrew Christians were going through persecution. It was a dark time for them. And listen, as he speaks to them, you can almost take those words and apply them to any situation we're in. And it would certainly apply to those people during that time who are hiding uh, in, in any place they can find, away from uh, the Antichrist and away from the false prophet. Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 1. Listen to these inspired words. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him. Put your eyes on him. Think of him. Verse 22, You are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Listen to the last statement. For our God is a consuming fire. It may be dark. It's as dark as I've ever seen it. And I don't mean physically, I don't mean economically, but I definitely mean spiritually. People are lost and they love to be lost. They don't know God and what they think they know of God, they hate. They don't know God's people, but what they think they know of you, they despise. This world is a dark, dark world. But thank goodness, thank the Lord, that God's Word has told us all we have to do is look under the author and finish of our face. Look to Jesus Christ. He is standing for us. And the darkness of this world cannot, cannot overcome that. Let's take our hymn books. I'm sorry, it's going to be on the screen. Let's all stand. In my mind, I'm looking at that clock back there and I'm right on time. If I'm not, don't tell me any different, please. <laughs>